Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and welcome to the Carnegie Endowment in Washington. And since I know we have a large and enthusiastic online audience in this era of Zoom, as is my practice, let me also say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of them, wherever in the world they may happen to be. I'm Evan Feigenbaum. I'm Vice President for Studies here at Carnegie. And it is both my privilege and my pleasure to welcome to this podium, on this stage, at this institution, the Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Commonwealth of Australia, Penny Wong, on her first visit to the United States as Minister for Foreign Affairs. Now, I am a little biased because we've known each other for a little while, but I dare say, and I can say this confidently, that Penny Wong is, in my view, uh, the most dynamic, active, and energetic foreign minister in the world today. Oh. <laughs> and, it's, and it's hard to keep up with her sometimes. <laughs> so um, she took on this role in uh, May of this year when the Labor Party formed its first government in Australia since 2013 under Prime Minister uh, Anthony Albanese. And she has been spearheading Australia's diplomatic engagement in the Indo-Pacific region and beyond ever since. Now, I will tell you, this is not her first rodeo as a minister. She is deeply experienced with a lot of portfolios. She's been minister for climate change, an issue that she cares passionately about. She has been minister for finance and deregulation. She's a senator, and so she's been the leader of both the government and the opposition in the Senate. And now, six months and 22 countries into her role, she has maintained a truly frenetic pace and I would argue is redefining Australian diplomacy in the process. Now, um, before I hand the podium to the minister, I do want to just say three very quick things about this alliance, the very dynamic US-Australia alliance, directed particularly at the Americans in the audience who may not be as deeply steeped in it. Um, the first thing is, of course, that we live in an era of geopolitical turbulence and risk. And the war in Ukraine has only exacerbated this all the more. Um, we can abhor war. Uh, it reminds us of the horrors that exist in the world. It commands our conscience, but more, pathologies that a lot of us thought were frozen in time have roared back with a vengeance. And so if we abhor war, then we need to prevent war, which means investing in deterrence. And after all, the United States and Australia are at the core security partners and allies. And that's been central to the agenda that Minister Wong and her colleague, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Defense Richard Marles, have been engaged in this week in Washington with Secretary of State Tony Blinken and the Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin at the US-Australia Ministerial or Osman consultations. Many Americans don't know this, but American forces actually serve <clears throat> under a foreign commander, General Sir John Monash, an Australian commander, at the Battle of Hamel in July 1918. And Americans and Australians have stood shoulder to shoulder ever since. So when Prime Minister John Curtin, a great labor prime minister, at the end of 1941 said America look, Australia looks to America, it has been the basis of this partnership ever since, and that remains central to the agenda. Second, security, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region, is obviously not the end of the story, and it had better not be, because rules, norms, and standards are being set, not least by trade agreements, but also around issues like climate change and environmental standards. Um, Americans sometimes forget the importance of being a standard-setting nation, but we don't have to tell Australians, who are members of all of those trade agreements, but are also driving a lot of environmental standards of the importance of that. And so we have a lot to learn from our Australian allies on that, too. Third and last point, this part of the world, the Indo-Pacific, it's not just about the United States and China. There are more players. And in fact, because there are more players, it's more important than ever that the United States and Australia jointly and in complementary ways and with other partners, particularly democracies, have an affirmative agenda that speaks to the needs and aspirations of countries around the world. And Minister Wong has really spearheaded, particularly in the Pacific, but also in Southeast Asia, a lot of that energetic Australian diplomacy, but also has driven some of the joint 
American and Australian diplomacy as well. So we need to treat these countries not as the objects of competition, but as the subjects of their own stories. And the more that we do so, the more this vital alliance will continue to play a broader role in the region. Now, I'm going to hand the podium to the minister, but I do want to apologize to the audience with one thing, which is that uh, the minister's had a very frenetic schedule, and so she woke up this morning having lost her voice. Um, <laughs> And so uh, the good news for all of us is that a team of very well-qualified doctors and specialists came by the hotel. And uh, one, one well-qualified, I thought it was a whole team, one well-qualified doctor and gave her, gave her the kind of shot that only the Rolling Stones and other rock bands are normally entitled to get. And so now that she's had it, she's managed to come here and she's going to power her way through the speech. But I do want to apologize on her behalf because she's been feeling a little under the weather. We're going to let her escape from us after she's delivered her speech at the podium. And I know she very much wanted to engage in a dialogue and answer questions from all of you. And if you've seen her in action, you know nobody can do it better. But we're going to give you a rest and let you rest your voice. And so with that, please join me in welcoming the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Penny Wong, to the Carnegie Hall. Well, thank you very much, Evan, and thank you for that introduction. It was a legal injection. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd better make that clear. So I do apologise, and I, I genuinely um, regret that I both sound somewhat unusual, but also that I won't be able to um, struggle through questions, because I usually find, particularly with an audience like this, that that's one of the most um, interesting, albeit challenging parts. Can I first thank uh, Evan, uh, and, and the um, endowment, uh, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace is you know, well known to you. Uh, I'll, I'll ma make some more comments about that shortly, but I can I acknowledge the many distinguished guests uh, in the audience, um, uh, the Australian Ambassador to Washington, um, Ambassador Sinodinas, the Secretary of my department, Jan Adams, uh, Ambassadors, uh, and representatives from across the Indo-Pacific. I see members of the Pacific Island Forum and of ASEAN. It's nice to be here amongst friends. So thank you very much for, for joining us. And can I say what a great pleasure it is to be speaking here today. What a great pleasure it is to be speaking. <laughs> <laughs> My staff, I think, have taken the chance to try and say all the things to me they wanted to say without riposte. <laughs> but it is now over. <laughs> So the objective of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace since its founding donor, Andrew Carnegie, established it in 1910, has been to promote international cooperation by advancing knowledge and building relations around the world. For more than a century, the institution has served the cause. Andrew Carnegie described as to hasten the abolition of war, the foulest blot upon our civilization, and no one looking at the impact of Russia's war against Ukraine can doubt the continuing suffering war inflicts. Over its long existence, the endowment has made vital contributions to our thinking about the world and to the institutions of global governance. The existence of the UN Commission on Human Rights and efforts to control the dangers of nuclear weapons and limit their proliferation all owe a great deal to the ideas, analysis and relationship building which the Carnegie Endowment makes possible. And they are all objectives to which the Albanese Labor government stands behind. As I said, it's also such a great pleasure to be in eminent company, ambassadors, distinguished guests and friends. If I were in Australia, we, we, I would begin this gathering by drawing on the Australian Indigenous practice of knowledge, acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we gather. In that vein, I, I wish to acknowledge the Piscataue and the Nakotshan, Nakotshan, the traditional owners of the land on which I am standing in Washington, D.C., and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I've had the pleasure of wish, visiting Washington many times. This, of course, is my first visit to Washington, but my second visit stateside as Australia's Foreign Minister. And I'm visiting with my friend and colleague, Australia's Deputy Prime Minister, and our Minister for Defence, Richard Miles for the Australia-US ministerial meetings, known as OSMIN. OSMIN is the annual convening of Alliance Partners, an opportunity to assess where we are and where we need to be. Tonight, we travel on to Japan, 
another of our relationships that is closer and more important than ever. As Alliance Partners of the United States, Australia and Japan recognise, as do many others, the strong and enduring contribution of the United States to stability and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific. Evan started his comments with a discussion about the alliance. It is an alliance between two nations, a story of two nations working together to secure the peace, to foster prosperity and to enable stability. It is more than history or tradition. It is a living expression of two countries aligned by who we are, what we stand for and what we want. Two of the world's most diverse countries, both home to ancient cultures and generations of immigrants. Two robust democracies whose people's voices and values are heard and protected by the rule of law. Two countries who share an interest in a world that is open, stable, prosperous, where all countries can make their own sovereign choices. It is a sure sign of how committed Australia is to our alliance that both sides of our politics take credit for it. Australian Conservatives like to point to the fact that the ANZUS Treaty was signed and ratified in 1951 when they were in power. The Australian Labor Party, of which I'm a member, correctly insists <laughs> that it was the turn to America by Labor Prime Minister John Curtin <coughs> during our darkest hours in World War II. And President and the US answering Curtin's call that forged our alliance. With everyone having a stake in the origin story of the alliance, we can see the alliance's centrality to Australia. We can be confident it has a durability that transcends the necessary inconstancies of our democracies. And we can be confident that our alliance has a durability that will withstand all nature of the challenges we face. As an American ally, Australia has been greatly encouraged by the value the Biden administration has placed on America's network of alliances. And it is an unrivaled network with vast reach. And each of those alliances and partnerships is a force multiplier. In peace, as in war, we have this alliance because we can achieve more together. We especially can achieve more in our region, where in the post-war era, American leadership formed not just the basis of the security order, it also formed the basis of the economic order. It helped assure the rules-based system <clears throat> that underpinned the region's stability and powered decades of unprecedented growth and prosperity. But as we all know for some time now, there has been a reshaping of the region underway. This changing strategic environment needs to be understood for its impacts both on the security and the economic orders. Both our countries understand that we face the most challenging strategic circumstances in the post-war period. The region is home to the largest military build-up anywhere in the world in that period with limited transparency and reassurance. And we are seeing our region become more dangerous and more volatile. North Korea has conducted more than 60 missile launches this year. And in August, five Chinese ballistic missiles were reported to have fallen in Japan's exclusive economic zone. Today's circumstances have prompted various comparisons with 1914, the 1930s and 1962. But we are not hostages to history. We decide what we do with the present and we decide what we do to help shape the region that we want. We want to live in a region which is open, stable, prosperous and respectful of sovereignty. Where disputes are guarded by international law and norms, not by power and size. A region that is peaceful, a region that is predictable. Where our countries and our peoples can cooperate, trade and thrive where our relations are based on partnership and respect. Where we respect the agency and the leadership of regional institutions, whether they be 
the Association of Southeast Asian Nations or the Pacific Island Forum. And it's clear to me from my travels that this is what most of the region wants as well. But I have also observed a region not enthusiastic about great power competition, a region which doesn't want to be forced to take sides. Countries of the region put a premium on stability and are wary of anything that looks like destabilisation. And they seek partnerships that are transparent, partnerships that create economic and social value. So Australia is responding to these changing circumstances. We are meeting the region where it is. We are, we are investing in our national power. We are doing this by creating deterrence with major military investments in future capability, in th including through the AUKUS partnership. And we continue to progress enhancement of our alliance through force posture cooperation. We are doing this by creating domestic economic resilience through more robust supply chains, making more things in Australia and skilling our people. And we are doing this by investing in our diplomatic power, renewing Australia's closest partnerships and advancing our interests and values. And we are bringing more to the table, supporting the region's aspirations for economic development, critical infra infrastructure and the clean energy transition, returning to a constructive role on climate change supporting the Pacific's priorities in law enforcement and security, making major new investments with development assistance and through loans that don't impose unsustainable debt burdens, developing Australia's economic strategy for Southeast Asia for the next two decades. We are supporting regional partners to become more resilient so they have less need to call on others. In all these ways, we are making Australia stronger and more influential, working to make Australia a partner of choice for the countries of our region. And the value of our engagement in the region is central to the value we add in our alliance with the United States. And framing the substance of our engagement is the manner of our engagement. There is no doubt that some of the way Australia has engaged over the past decade has weakened our credibility just when we needed it most, in a competition for influence. We allowed old narratives to re-emerge that positioned Australia as the other. And the most profound concern of the Pacific family, climate change, was not taken seriously, treated as an ideological extravagance rather than the existential threat that it is. Well, the Albanese Labor government is taking a different approach. We take an approach that puts listening above lecturing. An approach that focuses on creating choices rather than demanding sides be picked. An approach that confounds old narratives. An approach that aligns Australia's interests with those of our partners, whether on climate, infrastructure or economic opportunity. The Biden administration and the Albanese government have been on the same page on this, as affirmed by both our Osmin hosts this year. Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin has declared America is following the wise counsel from Prime Minister Lee, who argues that nobody should force binary choices on the region. And Secretary of State Anthony Blinken has described the administration's approach to the region as not about forcing countries to choose, it's about giving them a choice. This kind of diplomacy creates space to reshape the regional discourse. It creates space for more favourable decisions, for fostering alignment and for delivering shared value. Creating shared value is mission critical. I might refer to Evan's own comments at length here. When he told Congress earlier this year that the United States was the principal provider of both security and economic related public goods and other benefits. We kept the peace, but we also enabled prosperity. First, by being the principal source of demand for Asia's export-led economies to power their way to prosperity, and then also because we were the region's standard setter. 
<clears throat> so for the Alliance to respond to the challenges of a changing region, we must accept that while we have done a good job on military deterrence and response capability, we have a great deal more to do to reduce the risk of conflict and to influence the shaping of the region in our interests. This is why we are modernising the Alliance and broadening Osmin to integrate new areas for cooperation, speaking to the region's priorities. And the US Indo-Pacific strategy makes clear the US understands the strategic necessity of its consistent role in the region to be more effective and enduring than ever. And the US national security strategy makes it clear the Biden administration also understands the imperative of adding value, the need to make serious effort toward improving the lives of people around the world. And America's network of alliances and partnerships can expand the reach of that value. For example, my Indian counterpart, Dr Jaishankar, describes the Quad as a collaborative effort that serves the international community and the global commons. And we see the Quad working alongside ASEAN and other regional architecture to advance our shared interests with the countries of Southeast Asia. Australia too has a big job to do in supporting enhanced American economic engagement in the Indo-Pacific. And this has to be a core alliance priority. You see, economic engagement matters for two reasons. First, we need to show our partners we want to do business and create wealth with them. Second, we need to demonstrate that we have shared interests we want to nurture beyond security interests. We need to demonstrate that their interest in stability and development is an interest we too share, that we have skin in the game in. They want the assurance that comes with knowing that their success is our success. Moreover, US policy should be based on a clear understanding of what the rest of the Indo-Pacific wants. And so when I travel, I discuss the future plans of our partners and listen to their hopes and anxieties. The region sees development, connectivity, digital trade and the energy transition as vital domains in which consistent US leadership and influence would be welcome. America's decision not to proceed with the CPTPP is still being felt in the region, just as the decision not to proceed with the TTIP is being felt by international partners. Plainly, there is a view in Washington that US allies must work together on principles of collective security. But we've also reached a stage in the evolution of our alliances where they will increasingly require a fully developed economic dimension as well. For Australia, our membership of the CPTPP, of RCEP and IPEF, underlines the point that our national interest lies in being at every table, at every table, where economic integration in Asia is being discussed. Now, the broad take-up of IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Engagement Framework, demonstrates the appetite for American economic leadership. And, of course, climate action is among the most critical value we can offer the Indo-Pacific and I'm so pleased we have now embedded it in the work of the Alliance and OSMIN. And likewise, recognising the strategic need to get the most out of our alliance, we will continue working toward better overall alignment <coughs> on development finance and development assistance. A commitment to the region requires greater economic engagement, in itself central to achieving a more favourable equilibrium. At the same time, Australia sees enhanced defence capabilities as essential for deterring conflict in our region. Our new capabilities will make Australia better able, in collaboration with allies and partners, to deter aggression and help ensure strategic balance is maintained in the Indo-Pacific. This means countries of the region will continue being able to make their own choices. That is why it is so important that we correct suggestions that such improvements in our capability are a source of disruption in our region. 
One of the persistent claims we hear in the region is that AUKUS is driving an arms race or the militarisation of the region. Yet, as the Deputy Prime Minister Richard Miles has said, Australia does not question the right of any country to modernise their military capabilities consistent with their interests and resources. China's military build-up is now the largest and most ambitious we have seen by any country since the end of the Second World War. He went on to say, but large-scale military build-ups must be transparent. Australia has committed to transparency in our ambition to acquire nuclear-powered submarines. We remain steadfast in our support of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons as the cornerstone of the global nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament regime, and we are closely working with the IAEA. Indeed, our party has a long and proud history in advocating for nuclear non-proliferation. And at a time of dangerous rhetoric and destabilising behaviour from Russia, while we are reinforcing even further Australia's tradition of robust non-proliferation advocacy. As outlined in our Osmin joint statement, yesterday we discussed the need for China to take steps to promote transparency in the area of nuclear weapons. The US 2022 Nuclear Posture Review identifies China's increasing capabilities of threat to the United States and its allies, but it also emphasises that dialogue can manage risks. It points to the value of strategic dialogue and crisis management. And so I welcome the powerful contribution by former Australian Prime Minister and renowned China scholar Kevin Rudd. In his recent book, he makes the point that managing strategic competition requires guardrails that establish hard limits on each country's security policies, except that both sides will seek to maximise their position within these limits and welcome, if not encourage, areas of collaboration that are potentially in both countries' interests. There is enormous wisdom on the management of strategic competition in the perspective of President Kennedy. And I want to, as an aside, say to this audience how honoured we have been this year to receive Carolyn Kennedy as, Australia, as America's ambassador to Australia. You could have no finer representative. If, if I may, I wish to quote President Kennedy's 1963 commencement address at American University. Let us focus on a more practical, more attainable peace, based not on a sudden revolution in human nature, but on a gradual evolution in human institutions, on a series of concrete actions and effective agreements which are in the interests of all concerned. There is something of a guide in the diplomacy spurred by the 62 Cuban Missile Crisis. It drove more effective communications between the US and the Soviets, who moved towards measures, measures like the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty of 72 and the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty of 1991, increasing transparency and placing limits on weapon numbers and delivery. The 1972 Incidents at Sea Agreement instituted guidelines for the American and Soviet navies to use when operating in close proximity, providing opportunity for questions and notifications and building confidence. The 1975 Helsinki, Helsinki Accords added to the bilateral relationships framework, agreeing geographic frontiers, avoiding use of force, interference and human rights dialogue. And President Biden put guardrails on the table with President Xi a year ago. And most recently, we saw him use his meeting at the G20 with President Xi to underscore the need for guardrails. Guardrails that enable responsible management of competition. Australia welcomes President Biden's leadership. It is in all of the world's interests that his overtures are met. And we hope that, contrary to suggestions from some analysts, Beijing does, not, does see an interest in pursuing a joint strategic framework with Washington. And we hope that what Kevin Rudd describes as the turbocharging of Chinese nationalism has not made international cooperation impossible. Because the kind of leadership, the kind of international leadership we need to prevent catastrophe must be supported 
and must be encouraged across the political systems of both China and America. Heads of government need assurance that nationalistic domestic posturing won't sink their efforts to build safeguards. And equally, all of us, all of us with an interest in a region that respects sovereignty and is open, stable and prosperous should be clear in our call that President Biden's course confirms the US desire for stability and that we look to China to meet it. The region would be safer if they did. And those middle and smaller powers which comprise the Indo-Pacific, including ASEAN and its members, have an existential interest in pressing for the management of great power competition. I have the great honour of speaking on behalf of my country at the General Assembly this year. And I made the point that each nation must exercise its own agency. It can't just be passive. Because ultimately it is up to all of us to create the kind of world to which we aspire. Kevin Rudd explains why. 1914 reminds us that once mobilisation starts and even a low level <coughs> shooting match gets underway, all efforts overnight swing from diplomacy to the military and the desperate need to win. Our task is to prevent us from reaching that point. <coughs> Two pages. An option that creates time and space for further political and diplomatic problem solving is to be encouraged. <coughs> In other words, greater military capabilities are prerequisite, but it is not enough to keep us safe. <coughs> we need to do more than establish military deterrence to conflict. We need to work together to create the incentive for dialogue. And none of us big, middle or small, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and none of us, big, middle or small, should yield ourselves as hostages to history. <coughs> Building the conditions for a peaceful, open, stable and prosperous world in which sovereignty is respected. <coughs> must be the principal aim of Australia's diplomacy, <clears throat> of America's diplomacy, of every nation's diplomacy. <clears throat> a continual focus on the concrete steps which can and could be taken to manage competition helps the region understand America as contributing to stability. <clears throat> Those kinds of responsible initiatives themselves expand American influence. To be effective in managing strategic competition, our alliance needs to be more effective in the Indo-Pacific. That means ensuring the region has choices which helps protect country sovereignty. <clears throat> that means we have to compete not just in the traditional domains. We need to offer the region sustained value. <coughs> they compete in all domains to ensure our interests and our ongoing influence. Because as President Kennedy told us, genuine peace must be the product of many nations, the sum of many acts. It must be dynamic, not static, changing to meet the challenge of each new generation. <clears throat> well, we are several new generations on since those words were spoken. But as the great builder of alliances and networks, American leadership remains truly indispensable and elevating this asset may be the most important guardrail we have. Thank you very much.
Well, Minister may I just say we know the pace you set <laughs> and we know the schedule you keep and we know you powered through this this morning. And I, again, on behalf of the minister, I want to apologize to the audience on the Q&A, but I hope you'll join me, all of us here in the room, but also the Washington community, in thanking you uh, for sharing your thoughts with us and particularly on behalf of my colleagues for coming to the Carnegie Endowment Thank you this morning. Thank you. Please join me in thanking you. <laughs> Thank you.